examination and for that uh, which is the uh, school certificate examination that's why the traffic jam is unbearable today uh, so our uh, some of the participants and so our discussion she is on our way but given the fact that she has been supplied with the materials uh, and she has already read the papers so uh, and we also have a very tight schedule so we will try to start the session on time and uh, she um, i hope that we will we will be have uh, able to have her in 10 minutes time or so so today's session is the second session on gender equality and development and uh, i was present in the, in yesterday's session as well and um, just like yesterday's session here we have four papers and it's very interesting that in all four papers, it's methodologically uh, strong methods have been uh, used and very interesting research questions. And I would say research question from a wide variety of topics have been selected. So we have paper on gender budgeting. Uh, we have paper on intimate partner violence. We have paper on women's work and uh, income earning. We have paper on women empowerment. And interestingly, we have also paper from three different countries, four papers from three different countries. We have two uh, uh, papers uh, from India, one paper from Bangladesh and one paper from Cameroon. And uh, we have two of the present uh, paper presenters are here with us and two presenters will be connected online. So without uh, further delay, we can start the session and the uh, paper presenters will have around 10 minutes of time and they will be uh, informed uh, about the time and the management uh, by the uh, by some of the volunteers. Uh, so try to uh, keep the time uh, within the time. Try to finish your paper because we also have more sessions to follow up. So uh, we have uh, the the first paper is by uh, Dr. Ashraf uh, Pukyamat. Sorry for <laughs> mispronouncing and. He will be talking about uh, gender budgeting, uh, uh, difference in difference ap approach in the context of India. And he is the assistant professor, School of Social Science and Humanity, um, Amravati, Andhra Pradesh, India. Right. Oh, I'll use this. Uh, very good morning to one of our present here and the dignitaries on the stage. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to present a few of our ideas on general budgeting, uh, like concentrating on India. And I think it's fresh because I have not seen anybody presenting on gender budgeting yet in, in this conference. So um, I suppose uh, there, there is a need of uh, introduction to gender budgeting, though I know, I know the interest of the time. Because when somebody says gender budgeting, it is, for some it is public finance, for somebody it is gender studies, for some it is public policy, policy, political science, political economy, it's a lot. And in from economics perspective, there is a wide, wide misunderstanding that gender budgeting is uh, budgeting for women or allocation for women in public finance, but it is not. Actually, the interest of gender budgeting is to see the budget, the public finance through a lens of gender, to see that how the incidents happen. Is, is the allocation incidentally on men or women, or is there is a discrimination outcome later on? This idea is conceived from the classical economics notion that economics is gender neutral and it considers everyone alike, like a homogeneous unit and so on and so forth. And there was no addressing of gender issues in economics for centuries. And it is only in the post uh, World War time that you are discussing about development and gender equality, all those things in, in economics very seriously, especially with the path breaking work of uh, Esther Bosserup in 19. 70, if I'm recalling it correctly, where, where, where she talked about women in development. And then there are like parallels of a lot of civil developments uh, in the literature. And I'm not ex explaining all of them, but let's say uh, the, the notion that I'm taking here is, is very economic, empirical, and sort of testing. And it's not, I mean, somebody can equally argue that that is not correct because gender is very subjective. That way. So when we look at the review of literature, there is plenty, and the review of literature is interesting because it shows the most of the literature reviews uh, conclude that India is a is a dominant gender budgeting country. That is the focus of my presentation too. Why it is a, a very 
let's say exhaustively studied countries because that there are fiscal there is fiscal federalism that multiple government governments on different tiers and almost all the tiers of the government from the union government of india to the local self government at the panchayat or village level i do not know what you say it in bangladesh uh, all at all these levels general budgeting initiations were there since 2005 but then it's not i mean it's very lucrative by this picture but then it is not very lucrative when you go deep into the literature review saying that there are like sheer criticism against general budgeting in india such as for instance it's more of a technical jargon it it, it kind of uh, feminized welfare it is sort of patriarchal approach in a document and there is a lack of understanding of gender itself when it is being budgeted and so on and so forth there are a lot like it includes my own criticism for instance in my, in my phd thesis that india had five year plans sort of development idea initially and we have given up with them but five year plans eventually created gender budgeting as a component plan that there will be 10% allocation for women or 5% allocation for women in the entire plan it's like not gender sensitive rather a, a common threshold uniform threshold across all the sectors and which is a bad idea in gender budgeting idea so one of the empirical economic issue in gender budgeting in india despite its existence for almost 20 years now is that there is no gender segregated data that is available on india to test or to check whether there is some impact that we can say tangible after the say introduction of gender budgeting in india so i'm not taking uh, too much on the context now i suppose it's clear so i'm trying to address that gap that the quantities quantitative studies in gender budgeting are rare the, the accumulated concentrated literature on gender budgeting in india is so much qualitative or let's say descriptive that says that this priority is good the priority is bad or this policy is good the state is good the state is bad so those sort of type atomies so i'm kind of try to break that path and address the issue of gender disaggregated data let's say by using some other data and see it at the state level instead of the union budget level because the understanding is that gender is something which is kind of subjective and it has to be understood from the ground so in india you know it's union government and there is a union budget but indian states are very distinct unlike other countries say south indian states are 100% different from north indian state or states from northeast india or yeah close by this area would be very different from the west so i am looking at the state level gender budgeting initiations so that it is more gender sensitive and the data i used is here for gender budgeting statements of indian states uh from 2007-6 wherever it is applicable at the state level to 1890 and there is a parallel demographic health survey from us aid which in india we call as nfhs national family health survey but i took the original data dhs for two periods to see that what is the difference it has made in various indicators the methodology that i used is difference in difference method which tells us that due to a policy intervention what has happened over time that we have two time period data that one data when policy intervention was not there gender budgeting was not there one data point after the policy intervention so there is always a constant difference possible over time and there is an intervention effect as you see in the picture so i'm not explaining much on that now so difference in differences apply understanding this that though india claims to be a very gender budgeting country and there are a lot of states that adopted gender budgeting initially the government records you will see that there are 18 states that has adopted gender budgeting but towards the end you see the sustained states states that are serious on gender budgeting and they executed around the four and the other 10 are non gender budgeting this is the grouping that gender budgeting non gender budgeting to see the intervention effect in the study so the theoretical framework is overarching on naila kabir's empowerment theory from 1999 where she says that empowerment takes in steps and it starts from resources that you get to access the resources and get the agency in due course and then you get empowered and that fits within the national policy for empowerment of women of india 2016 i am skipping these slides for the research that there are two sort of indicators that I have tested development indicators which are education and economic profile second is empowerment indicators which are mostly subjective decision making scenarios of women so let's see uh, social development indicators as you see in in education case gender budgeting states i mean forget about all the numbers and stuff just 
just hear the outcome that is very favorable or not. So profile of education of women in gender budgeting states have considerably expected to improve compared to non-gender budgeting states for that matter. Similarly, informal education, which is taken as a proxy of media exposure, is also good, positive in gender budgeting states compared to non-gender budgeting states. Whatever claim I, I make over here is compared to non-gender budgeting states in the study. Okay. Economic development indicators is good when we look at the family economic profile, it has improved, concerns reduced, and upper quintiles has improved. But employment, if you look at this, seems very problematic that it hasn't given any, any concrete indication that there is an improvement in the scenario, except for professional employment, but it is a very meager fraction in, in India or anywhere as far as women's employment is concerned in a developing economy. So employment has not, say, expectedly improved in gender budgeting state against our expectation. Empowerment indicators are interesting. All of the in empowerment indicator groups, the decision-making power of women on her own earnings, husband's earning, large household purchases in the family, healthcare decisions, contraceptive use, use decisions, and familial and relatives uh, mobility, that person's mobility from one place to another without consulting somebody, has all improved from husband's or someone else's decision-making power, usually in a patriarchal family. We expect to have a word of husband or father or somebody who is a male, the patriarch, in, in I'm concluding, in the family. And that uh, we, I mean, the woman will not have the mobility to move at home. So from that scenario, it has come to a scenario that it is a joint decision by the husband and woman together. And in, in three indicators, the first three indicators, it has come over into the autonomy, empowerment that Naila Kabir explains that. Women alone will make decisions, but expectedly, again, there is a patriarchal thin line saying that, in, for example, in contraceptive use, there is an autonomy in women's scenario. In case of husband's earnings or the familial earnings, women's autonomy has not attained. So let's say it's, it's, it's moving through. So the conclusion is that gender budgeting, does gender budgeting work? Yeah, it definitely worked at the state level gender budgeting in India, as far as the result of the study is concerned. And it is actually expectedly moving in steps, as Naila Kabir explains us in her empowerment theory, that it is taking up the resources scenario first, and women are, get, women are getting better access to resources so that they're able to do things way better than, I'm concluding, thank you, way better than the people who are in the non-gender budgeting states. That is, except the case of employment. Employment is, like there is a policy issue or cost correction required in case of employment is what is conveyance us. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, finishing on time as well. A very interesting uh, analysis, and we are very happy that uh, now we have with us uh, um, the discussion of the session, Dr. Kanti Amantunujhar, uh, who is the Associate Professor at North South University. So welcome. Uh, now we have the second paper. The second paper will be uh, presented online. And interestingly, we have um, uh, Dr. Anvesh Veda Nijan uh, from Cameroon. And he will be talking about the responsiveness of household asset endowment to child health uh, outcome in Cameroon, the role of woman empowerment. So uh, Dr. Anvesh, um, can you hear us? Dr. Anvesh, can you hear us? Uh, we cannot hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you can. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, I'd like to share my screen. Yes. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can see your screen. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Angri Veranjan presenting from Cameroon. And the title of my paper is uh, The Responsiveness of uh, Household Assets Endowment on the Child Health Outcome and the Role of Women Empowerment. All right, I'll begin with the introduction of the paper. It is observed that uh, the secret behind the development of most developing countries is linked to is linked to uh, women empowerment 
And it is observed that women empowerment contributes a lot in uh, the development of household welfare and economic development, as seen in most developing countries. Also, women empowerment serves as a remedy out of poverty via financial input and uh, has aspects of uh, has aspects of wealth accumulation via household assets. Household assets, according to Todero, 2011, is uh, more about physical, human, and financial capital. And uh, it is observed that in Africa, over 20 million women own houses and land. In Cameroon, out of the 52% of women that make up the population of Cameroon, only 13% of these women have sole ownership of property. And uh, it is observed that in most developing countries, the fundamental aspect of a household asset is land and uh, uh, ownership of houses. Further, household asset is not only fundamental for the well-being of household of the household by generating income. It also helps us. A remedy, women empowerment, and the accumulation of wealth, including um, uh, the purchase, of the includes, including the purchase of house and uh, the improvement of housing quality, has an impact on child health. So, also asset, so women empowerment is beneficial on the improvement of child of child health outcome. And uh, at that, we say. Women empowerment plays an important role on child on child health outcome because women are primary caregiver and women are primary caregiver of a child of child care and women empowerment improve child development and we say women empowerment have both income and substitution effect on child well-being. That is both negative and positive effect on child well-being. Consequently, women empowerment, child health, and household asset endowment are directly and indirectly linked because they help in improving well-being and child outcome. Uh, the objective of this paper is to construct women empowerment index in Cameroon and to assess the contribution of the various indicators of women empowerment and finally, to examine the influence of women empowerment in mediating or modulating the effect on child health on household assets in Dowman. And based on our literature review, uh, we have the conceptual framework that shows that women empowerment has a positive impact on household assets in Dowman by improving the economic status of uh, the woman, which later on contributes to the purchase of household or of houses sorry or lands and on the other side household assets endowment has a positive in, uh, impact on child health with good housing quality so women empowerment on the other side too linking to how to child health helps in improving infant nutrition uh cleaning and uh, providing cleaning and uh, spacious environment and also uh, guiding the mother to be aware of the various um, humanization processes or uh, humanization needed for child well-being. The theories used for this uh, uh, study was linked to the three concepts used. The very first theory linked to women empowerment was the sense ability, uh, capability and ability approach, which was a theory, sorry, which was used. And uh, the theory linked to child health was Grossman 1972 theory that talks about uh, investment in health capital. And the theory linked to household assets endowment is asset-based theory of uh, uh, Patson and uh, Reagan, 2000. And, uh, Dr. Abe, uh, I think uh, because you have five minutes left, I think it's better that if you just go to your uh, original work and contribution. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, 
the data used for this uh, study was a demographic health survey. They put demographic health survey 2000 and uh, 2011-2018 and uh, the methods used, we used the multiple correspondent analysis to construct the women empowerment index using five uh, primary indicators, uh, uh, employment, decision making, microcredit, ownership and the uh, freedom of mobility. And these five micro, uh, these five primary indicators were used as um, uh, were used were used as binary variables. Now to assess the influence of women empowerment on child health, we are, we used uh, the control function uh, analysis approach to bring out the direct and indirect effect of women empowerment on the child health. And uh, based on our study, we found that women empowerment about fifty two percent of women in Cameroon using the pool data are empowered and we realized that ownership of land contributes more in the construction of women empowerment then our main um, uh, finding which is on whether women empowerment mediates or modulates the effect on child health on household assets endowment we realize that women empowerment modulates the effect on household assets endowment because uh, women empowerment uh, child health changes it's a sign when when we guessed on household assets endowment using the interaction variable that captures the indirect effect of women empowerment and child health. On our table, we see uh, women empowerment having a positive impact on the household assets endowment. And we see that child health indirectly has a negative impact on household assets endowment. But with, with the use of um, a more our in the, uh, interaction variable women empowerment child health that captures the indirect effect. We see that women empowerment helps to modulate the effect on child health on household asset endowment with the positive value we have there. I've also realized that other uh, variables, demographic variables like uh, education, we realize that education directly has a positive effect on household assets endowment. And uh, we realize that um, uh, child health. Uh, age, sorry, we realize that age, age has an inverted U-shape uh, relationship with household assets endowment. And this is because as a woman grows older, her ability to accumulate wealth reduces. Uh, to conclude, we realize that with the year Domi, that is uh, 2018, which is considered as our uh, uh, measure year domi with the year uh, domi we realize that there's no great influence on or there's no significant change on household assets endowment from 2018 so to conclude the key observation is that women empowerment modulates the effect on child health on household assets endowment and also women empowerment has a positive effect on child health which is presented in the reduced form that was not a, a exposed here and uh, women empowerment modulates the effect of household assets endowment and contributes positively to household assets endowment. all right um uh, because of to recom we recommend that there is a strong interconnection between women empowerment, child health, and household assets endowment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anwe. And I think uh, we have uh, listened to another very uh, exciting and interesting paper. Uh, now we have another online presentation that is by Ms. Ornesha Mukherjee, uh, who is a PhD student about uh, does engagement in market-based activities impact women's ability in India, evidence from a panel data analyst. So over to you, Ms. Ornesha. Um, yes, am I audible and is my screen visible? Okay, thank you. Yes. So uh, good, morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Today, I will be presenting a chapter from my PhD thesis where I analyze the interrelationship between engagement in market-based activities by women and their ability in the domestic within the domestic domain in the context of India. Now, to set the background, what we what is um, 
observed is that India is one of the countries which has shown a consistently low female labor force participation in the world and it has remained low for a very long time. And this does not bode well for the employment empowerment theoretical models which posit that uh, women's access to incomes uh, or earnings improves their fallback position which further uh, increases or improves their bargaining power, autonomy, agency and brings about overall empowerment over time. Now by agency, we go by Naila Kabir's definition where she uh, defines agency as an individual's ability to define one's goals and act upon them such that agency acts as a binding force between resource accessibility like land ownership, education and a lot of other factors as well as um, achieving desirable outcomes. Now, Sabina Alkir further argues that agency also has two separate aspects to it. First is ability when, in which individuals are acting on behalf of all that they are assumed to carry. For example, women taking the responsibility of household chores and care work. As against autonomy, in which individuals act according to what they themselves value or what they intrinsically value. So autonomy tells us whether what the women are doing, they intrinsically value that or not, or whether they want to do it or not. Now, there are a lot of empirical studies. There's an extensive literature, uh, empirical literature that uh, frustrate a linear relationship between women's work and agency as that of posited by the empower uh, employment empowerment models. Emphasis has been on the type and location of work that women are engaged in. It is found that unpaid family workers in um, the family businesses or the family firms, they have no more power than women who are not engaged in any kind of market-based activity. Again, remunerative work, there is also a hierarchy within remunerative work. Remunerative work in the outside the household premises, that is in the private or the public sector, it is found to be better than the paid home-based work. Most of these studies that are cited here, they are in the context of India, uh, Egypt and Bangladesh. Now, um, although improvements have been made in the attempt to measure agency autonomy or empowerment over time, there is a limitation that remains. Uh, which is majority of these studies claim to measure autonomy agency or empowerment by employing same or similar indicators. But in effect, conceptually, the measurement corresponds to measuring ability. The mere observation that a woman is participating in a, a particular decision making within the household or is mobile or not does not tell us anything about what they intrinsically value. Right. So including conceptually sound indicators of both ability and autonomy is expected to provide a more concise picture of respondents agency and that has policy implications as well. Now there are also in this study I try to address this limitation and by employing similar uh, indicators I uh, construct the ability index. Second is there are few empirical studies that are focused on the type of work that induce greater exercise of agency by women. But barring some studies, there is a failure to address the endogeneity issue that takes place between women's engagement in market-based activity and their agency. So uh, because there's this entire debate that is ongoing that whether women were had agency in the first place and they were uh, and that's why they were able to work or whether their engagement in paid work or any kind of other kind of uh, um, market based activity is enhancing their agency. So this entire uh, endogeneity problem needs to be addressed and for that we estimate fixed effects uh, instrumental variable panel regression models. And finally, there is a dearth of studies that analyzes how women's abilities impacted over time corresponding to a change in their work status. So this is also something that the study um, tries to fill the gap. Now, I'll just uh, mention the major findings in the interest of time. Uh, the first, what we find is uh, we apply uh, multivariate analysis, PCA, uh, uh, principal component analysis to be particular, to construct the ability index, which yielded ability as a three-dimensional index comprising spousal violence, intra-household decision-making, and mobility. Now, while the scores of decision-making and mobility have improved over time, the same for spousal violence have actually witnessed a drastic decrease. Okay, so overall, the ability index was a remain more or less the same in the Indian context using the data that we have. Second, IV panel regression okay, results under yes, yep, under the second, yeah, thank you. 
the significant and negative impact that women's engagement in any form of market activity has on her ability scores. In effect, it is uh, women's engagement in regular wage and salary jobs that are observed to influence ability significantly and negatively. And this goes against um, the findings of the extreme literature. And three cross-sectional IV probit regressions highlight that continuation and engagement in some form of market-based activity is more likely to improve women's ability over time as against continued non-engagement in market-based work. So the data source the Indian major states, um, methods index construction, as I already mentioned, I applied the PCA method and initially I started off with 19 indicators encompassing domestic violence, uh, for, uh, ability to make fertility and marital decisions, um, sorry, um, mobility with permission, mobility with restriction, that is whether they are able to go out or not on their own, and control over financial assets. And all of the variables are dichotomous. The index has been constructed in the manner that higher the value of the index, uh, greater is the ability of women. Second panel data analysis, the ability index score is our dependent variable. The variable of interest is the world status of the woman. And we've done multiple regressions in which uh, the variable of interest keeps changing. Okay, And we also apply the IV method uh, such that over here we take the cluster level um, engagement of women in, the, in some kind of um, market-based activity as our IV. And same for the analysis over time. Now, results show that we have started off with 19 indicators for uh, constructing the index. The robust PCA results are obtained on 11 indicators. I already uh, mentioned the, that the ability index comprises uh, three dimensions. The differences in the averages of the scores over time is significant, but overall the ability score has remained more or less the same. So that difference is insignificant. Panel regression, the first stage regression results show that the cluster level variable, the IV that we had taken, that is positive and significant at 1% level, which means an increase in percentage of women in various kinds of activities at the neighborhood level increases the likelihood of an individual woman engaging in the same kind of activity. Going over to the second stage results, we find that engagement in any form of market-based activity has a negative significant impact on women's overall ability and much of this negative impact is coming from regular wage and uh, salaried work. Um, I have also done a lot of uh, sub-sampling because the rural and urban uh, labor markets are very different from each other. Sub-sampling has also been done for uh, different household incomes because of the U-shaped hypothesis uh, that is there. Um, this aggregation has been done by dimensions of ability, which shows that uh, work status is positively related to intra-household decision making. It has no impact on mobility, but it has a negative impact on spousal violence. There are a lot of robustness checks have also been done, and uh, the results are robust. Uh, quickly coming over time, 4.35% uh, of all the women in the sample, they witnessed an increase in their ability. And uh, what we find is while an immediate shift to engaging in market-based activities can cause a decrease in women's ability, continued engagement is observed to improve their ability over time. Now, continued in, uh, engagement in what kind of uh, market-based activity? What we find is this positive uh, influence comes from continued engagement in casual work and continued engagement in self-employment work. And, this, and there is a negative uh, association when women have continued engagement in regular wage or salary to work. So just, yeah, just I'm summarizing, this is the last slide. Uh, so just summarizing the result, we find that the pa uh, panel fixed effects results reveal that engagement in market-based activity at a point in time may be ability reducing. And this holds again for regular wage or salary to work. Over time, continuance in market-based activities is likely to be ability enhancing Positive effect comes from continued engagement in casual work, uh, which was primarily for the low income households where women are either supplementing the earnings of their spouses or they might be the uh, primary earning members. So the lack of income security compels them to work, but at the same time, they might be solely responsible for household decision making and there might be lesser restrictions on their mobility uh, because uh, they are uh, for, uh, compelled to work in the first place. And that is being reflected in the higher ability index course. 
For self-employment, it is observed to have a positive impact as well. It can be because of the satisfaction of uh, patriarchal norms. It is more likely in this form of employment because much of this work takes place within or uh, within the household premises or very close to the household premises. What is puzzling to note is that uh, the continued engagement in regular wages salaries has a negative impact on them. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Amnisha. Uh, I think we are on time. Uh, now, from online, we are to physical presence, uh, presentation by physical presence. So, we have Ms. Uh, Tasin Rifat, who is a student, a uh, fourth year student in the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. And she will be talking about intimate partner violence, mitigating or facilitating violence, facilitating violence investigating the influence of women's empowerment on intimate partner violence. Good morning, everyone. This is Tahseen Ripat. Uh, I am currently in my fourth uh, in my fourth year of undergraduate studies at the Department of Economics, um, University of Dhaka. My paper is about investigating um, the impact of uh, women empowerment on the prevalence of intimate partner violence um, in rural Bangladesh. Uh, let's start with a quick background. Um, we are all familiar with the initiatives of the government and uh, the various NGOs um, to reduce uh, intimate partner violence in Bangladesh. However, um, the Violence Against Women Survey uh, of 2015 conducted in Bangladesh uh, reported that 54.7% of married women um, experienced uh, domestic violence by their husbands uh, at least once in their lifetime. Uh, for decades, we have seen that um, anti-violence uh, initiatives focuses on um, emphasizing um, empowering women uh, by um, education, um, employment opportunities, or credit programs. Uh, from the existing uh, literature, uh, we can see that there are some uh, inconsistencies in the um, uh, in the results about the um, relationship between women empowerment and IPV. Um, in some studies suggest that uh, women empowerment facilitates IPV, and others claim that um, it reduces IPV. So to uh, create a more robust foundation for designing um, uh, for designing effective interventions uh, to reduce IPV, um, uh, we uh, I am trying to uh, figure out whether a woman's woman empowerment really uh, reduces intimate partner violence in rural Bangladesh. So in this regard, uh, this study focuses on two objectives. Um, assessing uh, whether um, the concerning relationship, um, uh, assessing the concerning relationship for all ages of women, and examining whether the uh, relationship varies across different cohorts of women. So this study is important because most of the prior uh, prior quantitative studies um, in Bangladesh employed cross-sectional data set. Uh, for which um, those studies considered women empowerment as a static um, uh, as a static phenomenon. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, most of the studies did not consider um, generational shift in this pattern. Uh, since I have used uh, uh, a three-year panel data set of Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey with uh, 6,717 married women, uh, this study is equipped to treat women empowerment as a dynamic process. Um, uh, to measure women empowerment, I have uh, I have employed um, four aspects of women empowerment, which are education level, um, employment, um, uh, sorry, four aspects of women empowerment, which are education, employment, decision making, and uh, freedom of mobility. 
Moreover, I have also controlled for some husband characteristics, household characteristics, and marital factors. Um, after reviewing the results uh, from, of uh, Hausman test, um, I have uh, chosen fixed defects logic regression model for this analysis as uh, the dependent variable IPV is a binary variable. Um, the regressions are run for uh, the entire sample as well as the segments that I have formed for the sake of the analysis of uh, generational shift. Um, as you can see that uh, this slide um, shows the segmentation into three groups. Um, however, we will be focusing on group one, uh, characterized as recently married women, and group three, characterized as long married women. And uh, we will be comparing between these two groups because um, I think this comparison will specifically help us examine the changes in societal views on women's empowerment and IT IPV dynamics uh, for uh, two different generations over time. Um, here you can see a summary of descriptive statistics. Um, uh, uh, I'll just quickly go over this that um, the uh, the progress in the aspects of women empowerment is evident from this from uh, this uh, descriptive statistics. Um, but regardless of this uh, uh, progress in women empowerment, uh, surprisingly, we see that the proportion of women getting abused by their husbands um, increased over the years. So now the question arises uh, that um, uh, why um, uh, why the rate of abuse is increasing um, regardless of this uh, woman empowerment. So uh, let's uh, dive into the findings from the regressions of this uh, study. Here I have only included the significant results. Um, uh, I think we would all agree that uh, the preconceived idea about the relationship between education and woman uh, uh, education and the prevalence of IBV is that um, increases in the level of education of both men and women um, have the potential to reduce the risk of IBV. Um, uh, however, uh, the findings of my study suggest that um, uh, husband's education has, however, no impact on uh, the prevalence of IBV and uh, women's education is only significant for uh, the uh, youngest uh, group of women, which is group one. Um, uh, on the contrary, freedom of mobility is only significant, freedom of mobility only has a protective uh, significant uh, effect against IBV only for the oldest group of women, which is group three. Uh, the component of women empowerment that is found to have a significant protective effect against violence for both group one and group two is um, decision-making capacity in household. Um, surprisingly, in the overall sample and among the oldest women, um, those with jobs are more prone to abuse by their husbands compared to unemployed women. However, in the youngest group, uh, employment doesn't show this kind of violence facilitating behavior. Um, then the reason might be that uh, men, especially the older men, uh, might use violence to control their wives' employment choices. This is also consistent with the finding that women who uh, let their husbands influence their uh, employment choices are more prone to experiencing intimate partner violence compared to those who autonomously decide to stay um, at home or uh, to work outside. This finding is indicated by the household uh, by the um, variable called domination in employment decision. Um, from the discussion so far, we can say that the contrasting effects of women's empowerment on IPV for recently married and long married women suggest that um, how. Uh, the uh, societal norms may be shifting. Uh, another interesting finding from the uh, another interesting finding from the household characteristics suggests that as husbands character and husbands contribute less to the household income, um, the occurrence of IBD increases. The explanation may be that uh, men use violence 
uh, to maintain the traditional gender norms to when the financial role is challenged. Um, uh, from the marital factors, we can see that the length of marriage emerges as a significant risk factor uh, for experiencing IPV for the entire sample, um, uh, as well as the women whose families have to pay dowry at their marriage are at greater risk of uh, getting abused by their husbands compared to the woman who didn't encounter dowry for uh, uh, the entire sample. Mm, to conclude, we can clearly state that uh, one fits all approach to IPV prevention uh, for the women of uh, rural Bangladesh is not enough with the continuously evolving um, social perception education can contribute to reducing IPV for the younger generation. However, for the women of older generation who are being abused by their husbands for a long time and eventually normalized being abused due to maybe ignorance or superstition, the same tools adopted for the younger woman will not work. So um, age-targeted interventions are necessary. So um, in this regard, maybe education Additional uh, campaigns or media awareness interventions may effectively inform these women about their human rights issues and therefore um, reduce the prevalence of IBB among the um, older generation of women. Thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kassin. Uh, now we have had uh, two online and two offline presentations. Now uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Kanti, uh, who is the designated discussion here. Uh, you have 15 minutes time to make comments on four of this paper. So over to you. Thank you very much, Vidishapa. Um, first of all, sorry, I got a bit late. Um, my apologies for that, for keeping you waiting, but uh, I'm glad you started on time. But why was I late? Can anyone guess why I was late? It's a thing. <laughs> it's, we cannot always blame it on traffic. Some other factors are there. Okay. Unpaid, I, unpaid care. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> my unpaid care uh, job uh, for my children. My son is six years old. Uh, I think he has a food poisoning. He's vomiting continuously. He has fever and he constantly wants me. No one else but his mother. So that's the biggest role of a woman uh, by nature. The law, children are more attracted towards their mothers. Fathers are, of course, there. But when, especially when they're not well, they want the mother. But I have to make a choice. I have to come here, uh, do my other duties also. Uh, responsibilities also perform my responsibilities, then I got late. So um, apologies again. We have to be professional uh, and we have to take care of so many things. So when we have these sort of discussions, we, when we have a specific session on gender equality and development, it again reminds us that there is inequality and gender gap, which I'm glad that the papers have addressed and have some very important recommendations. All the papers are excellent um, in terms of the findings, in terms of the econometric methods that have been applied. Um, I'll just try to connect the findings of the papers. For example, uh, when we say we need um, to create gender equality or reduce the gap, uh, there are reasons why there are gaps. So like um, um, Mr. Ashram, if I have pronounced it correctly. Okay. So um, I enjoyed reading your paper. It's such a um, 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 vast and extensive work on the budget. Um, that is one of the most important, uh, um, what do I say, factors that will contribute to reduce the gap. Um, so to ensure equality, we need to allocate budget properly as he found that where there are, there is uh, lacking of budget there are indicators um, showing that it is affecting women empowerment and other uh, 
sites. For example, um, yeah, okay, we, we did hear from him the findings. Uh, what was the major finding? I so you created this um, the intervention. Uh, so um, if I, I I kind of forgot also there was an intervention, so pre and post intervention, and looking at the effects of the budget. So um, we cannot just allocate equal budget all of a sudden. For example, if the ratio of male and female are different at school, we don't need equal budget for male students and female students. There will be a difference there. But if we can show that female students are doing better, their results in school are better, then we can advocate, we can um, uh, work towards this by saying that, okay, at Hakka University, if female students better or performance is improving, then they need more facilities, like more female halls, creating more better accommodation for them. There are so many students coming from outside hub, and we need to provide them clean and safe environment to stay and study so that they can participate, right, properly. So create the proper infrastructure for them. For that, we need budget. Once we have allocated budget for that, then we can ensure that uh, female are doing better. And once we show that they're doing better, we can ask for more budget. So that's how it should work. But there, we, we cannot just say um, to gender um, gaps, we have to allocate budget. It will take time and we have to gradually do that. So there has to be change in the structure, change in the mentality towards um, um, women and um, um, giving equal rights, etc. When we're sitting like this, there are not too many people in this room. But if it was too crowded, not all of you will be able to see me or reach out to me or participate together. But if we have a round table, we are all sitting in a circle, we see each other, we can talk side by side. Um, so people who are at the back, they don't feel like they're falling behind. So all these structural changes are Classroom designing is also very important. I was also a student of Hakka University Post Department, but I could not finish from there um, for various reasons. And then I went to uh, North South Area. I graduated from there. So at MCU, the class size was small compared to what I experienced in Hakka University. If I was a backbencher, if I was late, I could never participate. And if I did, I had to struggle. So the classroom structure, when it's a very huge room, teachers have to put in a lot of effort, stand up on the podium and kind of like scream and make sure that you, you can hear the teachers. Hey, now we have microphones, but not always we had microphones. So all these structural changes to um, make sure that it is rich and calm, the students. The, uh, having a good sound system, having a good structure in the classroom, these are very important. So as much as mentality change in Mentality is needed, structural changes are needed, legal change is needed, political changes, all these are important. So when you talk about budget, it's very important that we have enough budget to uh, provide enough facility for both male and female. And then the next paper was about, I think, uh, China here. So um, it's it's a common study that women empowerment will have an impact on China. Uh, if I'm an And if I'm more empowered, if I have more financial power, uh, stability, uh, that I will uh, yeah, need to depend on my husband or the father uh, to take to, decide to take him to the hospital immediately. If I put him in the hospital, there will be no one else to take care of him. Able to come. So I have to make a choice. And I know it is not that serious. Maybe I can do without taking him to the hospital. So the decision regarding my child is he did not influence here. Why I could make this decision, why I could make this choice, was because I had the understanding, the knowledge about the health, which comes, of course, because of my educational background, because of my knowledge, etc. Okay, so these are common findings. I think the paper can explore a bit more regarding the impact of empowerment on child. Find another unique area to explore.
to see the effect of women empowerment on child health care or because I know there are lots of studies looking at this, but there can be added um, other can, dimensions can be added to these studies. It's very actually presented. Um, the next one was uh, by uh, Ms. Anesha Mukherjee, um, um, a very another excellent paper. All of the papers are excellent. All the findings are very important for us to discuss and analyze. Here, um, Anesha talks about uh, ability that comes from market-based activities. Um, we have heard from her what she was saying, um, that when women are um, involved in regular uh, generating activities, um, I think she also has found the ability decline, or um, when it is continued, um, then the ability has increased. So ability means being able to take decision, being able to move forward, right? That something that gives power. And um, she talks about agency also. So what is the agency here? Agency means uh, again, the individual, what the individual wants to. So all these, to create um, an agency for yourself, as a woman, women has to take the initiative first. If you want to have an agency, if you want to have the ability to do something, you have to prepare yourself for that all the institutional, political, structural, financial changes are important. Like give them budget, scope to um, uh, be educated, but at the same time, change the structure, change the legal system, make sure there is no violence, etc. Give them the proper environment. But at the same time, women must use their ability to make change. For example, our prime minister, prime minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina, she made sure that um, women are put in, not only in stereotypical jobs, but in other types of jobs. For example, when we saw the metro plane being inaugurated, the female driver was driving it. When we saw the flyovers being expressed, she made sure that and always at the booth, there are female employees. So this is a change. She is bringing in changes, which is coming forward to do other types. We don't see drivers, female drivers, do we? But the other thing I was thinking, if I needed to stay back till 11 p.m. and if I employed a female chauffeur for our car, how will she be able to take care of her children? Because I know the mindset she has or the system she has in her family will not allow her to stay back. Again, as I said, children want their mothers more than the fathers. Either we cannot deny this fact, but fathers have to come forward. It's the dual responsibility that we always talk about. I have to manage home and work. This is going to be a challenge for everybody, it seems like, but it should not be a challenge for you. You should break the barriers. You should change the stereotypical role of women. So, Women must ensure, women must come forward to change um, to show the ability that they have. And so, um, facilities like, when, say, another example, cricketers. Uh, we don't see the female cricketers being working in the when they win a match. But we see Takibal Hassan is given a branded car. We, we never hear uh, uh, Salva, the captain of Bangladesh cricket team, is getting a card. We don't. So, more rewards are needed to encourage them. So, all these can be done. Um, you have to practice um, uh, raising your voice. Um, even I am raising my voice. Sometimes I become victim of, um, 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 how do I say, a group. Women. There are studies that show women's empowerment increases, increases a lot, not only because of financial freedom or being free from violence, etc., being in, uh, uh, allowed to work, etc. Empowerment also increases when you can have the ability of other women supporting them. Okay? So we need to form that support, so, but make sure that is used in a positive way. Sometimes I think uh, there are divisions, like working and non-working women. So these have to be uh, um, uh, from the system and it has to be a very cooperative approach to move forward. So um, 
Um, and another example that I would like to say, um, in Bangladesh Army, we see regular um, so female soldiers until 2010. We saw female brigadier or female major general only in 2020 or 2020, but from medical corps, not as the soldiers. There have to be changes. So female soldiers, we want to see brigadiers from that area. Medical sector doctors. In the Amra mainstream soldiers, they don't see them at higher position. So, um, uh, there was this other paper on the violence. Uh, the most, I think, the, uh, the, this is my interest area these days because um, this is increasing in MIT. She probably, if I'm not wrong, you, you show that. Among cohorts, different cohorts are age group. When we, women are more um, working in the labor force, it seems like they are prone to or they are being victim of more violence. Or only for the older cohort. Maybe if larger sample, we might see that older cohorts probably, because of the age or the mentality that they come from, they don't uh, protest anymore. Or this remains in the in those sort of parities. But younger women were in these days, they face abuse, they come out of it. And they have a better voice. They have better facilities waiting for them. The legal system is for them. They are more aware. But what I feel is when women are more empowered, when women have more voice, conflict increases because they are aware of their rules. And when they protest, the conflict starts. And it starts from family. These days, you will see that children also refuse domestic violence. If they see their parents fighting, they say stop. They're learning at school. They say this is not supposed to be the way it is, and I'm feeling stressed, I'm disturbed. So children, they don't take abuse, family abuse. They are also aware of why and how. They see in, in um, media, they are educated at school. It's not practiced that much in our way, but they told me from the surroundings, from the colleagues and friends, children are protesting also. So I feel that violence is taken because they are more um, aware of their rights, so they, they raise voices, and that should be the case. If there is violence, come out of it, stop it, do but there are other measures, okay? So the question was the literature that you have looked at. Does I feel that or empowerment is leading to more IV. This will be a dilemma until we uh, do more and more research. But my understanding that, or from, from, from whatever research I have done so far, I feel like when women are more educated, more aware, more raising their voices. So, conflict. So, the, Amar Tashen, in the, one of his papers in 1987, he said that in industrial areas, Owners and laborers will always have conflict because laborers are working for them. But end of the day, they will go back home and they will take from the owners who are ripping them off in terms of making them work. But a wife is always stuck with the husband when there is violence. So you want imagine the mental torture that women go through. If or in, in very rare cases where the men are abused because women are more abused for all the various reasons that we know, when they don't have job, they don't have, have financial ability, when they are not using a mobile phone to use, there, there is someone who is working at our house. She is a part-time worker. She's, she's an excellent woman, a very strong. The husband doesn't give her a mobile phone to use, but she is working, she's earning, she's giving money to the household. See, she's raising two, two, two of her children. And the majority of the um, expenses is borne by her. Yet she is not given a mobile phone. Often the husband calls my mother uh, to check on whether she's working or whether she's working. And she is reluctant about it. She says, I don't care. I, I do not want to get bothered by this. But this is also abuse. Right? This is also invading her privacy and freedom and putting a mental pressure on her. She is working with this pressure. So imagine the mental torture that women have to endure at times. Right now, I'm not feeling tortured, but back of the mind, I have tension how my son is doing. He's probably crying. He's probably asking for me. He's getting more angry at me. When I go home, he will refuse. 
you will not come to me for the first 10 minutes. And slowly I'll have to probably buy him a cupcake and try to, you know, uh, convince him that I right. him. I had work. But I know that my sons, both of them will grow up, they will see me as a working woman and they will learn to respect us. So this is what every family is an institution and we have a role to play. If we see our brothers making us work in the kitchen, you say you and I should together. So that when your brother is married uh, to another woman, he respects her duties also. And then these two women will have a good relationship. So you build your community, you build your network. So research is very important. Uh, what are the things like give us budget, give us better child care, um, uh, space so that we can work peacefully, and also um, increase the ability all of the four papers are there, introducing gender gap. I thank the researchers for choosing for their research, and um, um, I hope the recommendations will be made. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanti, for um, such a um, discussion, which is uh, very close to all of our heart. And you have touched upon some very uh, critical area and uh, the rationale uh, for doing this research and the implications of this research. So now uh, it's time for question answer. So it would be good to have questions from the audience. So kindly just uh, introduce yourself and then ask the question. Hello, I'm Abhya Bhashti. My question, first question is uh, uh, to Dr. Amstrup Michigan. My question is that uh, for the higher education category, the coefficient uh, is negative, but you are explaining it as expected to increase. Why is that? And can you explain it? Same question uh, for wealth quantile C. <clears throat> My next question is uh, to Tassin Dipat. How did you divide the married woman category based on what the uh, length of the marriage? That marriage? And um, second question, how the education uh, coefficient is negative for group one? How do we explain that? I think we can, if there are any other questions, we can take one or two questions from the audience and then uh, we can get back to the researchers and uh, also the online researchers and then we can give them like one or two minutes and they can respond to the queries. So... Any other questions? You know, uh, the topic is uh, somehow very relevant and pertinent to our day-to-day -day life. So it's expected that uh, many of you might have questions in your mind. So I would suggest that you can, yeah, sure. I'm Maureen. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, my question is that uh, we will please repeat a little bit. Are you saying that intimate partner violence is more likely? Any other question? Yeah. Do you have other questions? Okay. Uh, if we don't have other questions, then we can uh, get back to the uh, presenters. Um, uh, I think first we hear from the presenters who are here and then we can go back to the online presentation. Okay. Yeah. Um, before coming to the question, like, I would like to thank uh, our discussion. And the point that she has made is actually like, uh, it's there in the paper, here at Eagle, but in the interest of time, it is there, for instance, the structural change that has to happen in, in, in our system is, is what we call as gender mainstreaming. And the gender budget in that say it's, it's very suitable example that instead of a layered system in a classroom, if you have one line that saves each other, so that there is a symmetry, like equality or rather equity that is attained automatically. So often we ignore the system in budget that capital expenditure, especially those are building or the infrastructure are gender neutral, are they? they are not. They ask man said again correctly that. If like, who are the most of the drivers who are apparently men, it's not chosen. Like as society is so 
So that whatever road construction capital infrastructure investment the budget put for this multiplier effect on men, that is undue difference, and then it has to be corrected, at least by positive discrimination or giving more prioritization for women, as she said, as the need arises, not like blanket. So thank you for adding that point that expands the discussion. And coming to your question, um, uh, I suppose the question is that higher education indicators are expected to increase according to my presentation and why uh, similarly, but two times three, right? Yeah. So higher education, as if you know, like we, we perceive having more education as say more empowerment, as again we have already discussed that when you are educated more, it is expected that you are far, you are far, like let's say get positioning from disempowerment to empowerment. It's more of like a process that move from zero to let's say one. It moves ahead. And higher education is what something we see as the ultimatum. And it is expected to increase, but it is um, not happening in the research event. We're calling it correctly. And partly, there can be theoretically explained in India that most of our policies or programs that is there for education generally are on the literacy, basic education, school education. For instance, you might recall that there was around for its higher education. I mean, it's literacy rate. Like I'm from Kerala. Can I do higher education? We often migrate to other states to educate ourselves after our schooling. It is literacy. Literacy literally means that you are able to read, write, and speak a language. And that's Malayalam, they will not help you. Most part of India, at least you should not hear me, for instance. There is a language policy in it, but that's so higher education has not been addressed with the indication, implication over there. It was expected to increase, it is it has been increased. Q3, quintile 3 is again a scale that which is Q1 to Q5. Q5 is the richest category, Q1 is the poor category. So from Q1 to Q2, poor category, the down category, the women who are involved in the study are expected to move in the scale to the higher quintiles. So the immediate reflection should have been there in Q3, but it is not there. From the lower class family, you will eventually move to middle class family or lower middle class family. Then you will go to upper middle class and high class family. But the response is should be saying that there is no say implication in Q3, indicating again that if you remember that in the presentation itself, we showed that the employment category is problematic. No employment scenario changes have happened as of general budgeting intervention. So when there is no employment has happened, probably you are not addressing the wealth mobility. The higher classes then have to be understood in a way that there may be some external effects in the scenario, say as in terms of remittances that move the family so that foreign remittances or husband income earning increase or the other wing part income increase so that the family class will move from say poor scenario to higher scenario you know the exchange rate is different to now and India is one of the major uh, receiver of remittances across the globe so that's how I mean that's why the paper is already what the theory so if you're interested please read it in thank you thank you Uh, so the first question that you asked, there was a segmentation. I have segmented the sample based on length of marriage. Uh, so suppose um, I have taken the lowest quantile in the context of marriage as group one and the highest quantile um, uh, in this context as group three and the middle two quantiles are in group two. Uh, so the group one is uh, the one consists of the women who are the youngest generally the most um uh, okay so why education is negative uh, why the association between education and time is one um uh, as i wanted to show that there has been a generational shift uh, in the pattern how um the occurrence of IVB response to in response to uh, the aspects of women's environment so, uh, for instance, uh, education does not show any protective effect for the old women, however, it shows a protective effect for the, uh, for the uh, youngest group of women, which is group one. Uh, so, this explains that um, the, how the society uh, perceives uh, the empowered woman um, has changed. And uh, for the younger generation, uh, uh, educated women are more valued by the society. Uh, as uh, you have asked, that uh, whether it's uh, whether women empowerment is really facilitating violence. 
uh, it, it, uh, again comes to that point, the generational shift. Uh, suppose, for instance, uh, in group three, uh, the older woman, for instance, if a woman of uh, age, uh, age 50, so uh, for for a woman, um, for uh, a woman of age 50, if she is employed, she is more likely to get uh, abused by her husband. Um, uh, her uh, financial empowerment is seen as a challenge by her husband. However, for the younger generation, as the societal norms uh, are shifting continuously, so if a uh, uh, married uh, Woman of age, for instance, 22 or 25, if she's uh, employed, uh, no, uh, if she's educated, then she's more valued. And for education, the pattern is uh, not uh, yet significantly, but it is expected to change uh, in, uh, from time to time. In the future, we may see that educated women are getting less abused by their husband. So it is on the process of changing. Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, we have two online participants. So, Dr. Anve, uh, do you want to add anything uh, to your presentation or uh, make some response to the uh, suggestions that uh, the uh, discussion has provided? All right. Um, you have one minute. Thank you. Related to my uh, research or to the paper, we realize that... Uh, there is always there has been literature on women empowerment and child health, but this the specific research gap that this paper is presenting is bringing out the negative aspects of women empowerment on child health, which was unchecked, which is later on modulated by um, uh, women empowerment modulating child health to bring out the positive impact on women's capability or ability to purchase uh, a properties such as land and uh, land or a household assets that will later on help them bring them out of poverty. That is using another dimension of women empowerment to uh, bring the household out of poverty through child checking through the check on child's health uh, negative aspects controlled and what uh, positive by the interaction between women empowerment and child health but okay with that um i didn't get the question from uh, the audience so i'll not be able to respond to the question thank you thank uh you um, thank you for presenting and thank you for responding. Uh, now we have Ms. Mukaji. Do you want to respond or do you want to make any final comments? Um, uh, thank you for the discussion on all of the papers and uh, my paper as well. So, uh, no, I actually don't have any comments, but uh, I would really like to thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, if you still have any burning question, you can ask. We have some time. Okay, uh, okay yeah, sure. No, no, it's not like, it's, it's not a question by your last, but like, let's say, an observation that um, you see, like, most of the presenters over here in the, I mean, I have attended the gender and development session yesterday. Women. Women. Yeah. Uh -huh. the women. Yeah, who has done it? So thank you. Even though, yes. uh, it's strange that I mean I'm not fearless the senior for in the in the event of seniority. Like I'm not expecting a lot of senior professors in the spine, and I see a lot of students from University of Dhaka attending this conference and presenting papers. And apparently, all the girls fall to be in these positions, and men are in political economy and banking or less economic rich notary. And of the few men who presented on gender and development yesterday, or those who are from Nepal and Sri Lanka, if I'm not wrong. So there is something has to be done in Bangladesh with regard to that diversity. Very right? good observation. Yeah. Thank Very you. Very good observation. observation. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when he was uh, just mentioning this, uh, I was thinking about in uh, 2023 when uh, Claudia Goldin uh, got the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, 
female uh, labor force participation. I think the next day I had a class and I went to the class and I was telling that uh, uh, now no one can tell that gender is a topic which is not a core economic topic and which is a topic which is we don't have, there's not a much of a requirement to do quantitative work or to do rigorous econometric analysis. So uh, I think this has been reflected in the in today's session and in the yesterday's session, I was a discussant. And what we have seen that nowadays, at least one good thing is like uh, people are coming out and people are trying to address the gender issue uh, and while applying different advanced methods, advanced technique, interesting data set, interesting research questions are being posed. So that is a very important thing. So one positive thing has slowly and gradually has happened. And I think we uh, want to again thank Claudia Golden for that. Uh, the second point, I think it's you are very rightly have pointed out uh, that uh, um, when I was asked uh, in any discussion or in any places, I'm basically a labor economist. Uh, people always ask me uh, to talk about gender. Uh, and uh, when there is a, but if there is a male, they, that person will be asked to talk about uh, probably labor. <laughs> so the thing is like, there is a sort of stereotypes even within our head that it is the woman who, uh, who who will do the research, who will do the work on women, and men will do some difficult things, although the fact that I teach econometrics, <laughs> but uh, that is the stereotype that we need to break. So that was the lighter part. And uh, from other part, what I want to say that today's uh, work is, or today's presentation is about gender equality and uh, development. Uh, now, uh, I would like to say one thing that, you know, it's why it's important because it's not only fact, uh, for the fact that it's for fairness or it's for ethical reason, but there are also important um, economic aspect as well. Economic rationale for having gender equity or equality or I would say equity as well. Because for example, uh, when we talk about uh, women, we should think about that woman as a as a human being and also as a workforce, uh, because we know that Bangladesh is going through demographic transition. But uh, when it, on the same time, we see that there is a huge percentage of women who are not in employment, education, and training, which is called need. So that means we have not been able to utilize that labor force. You have not been. We have not been. Able that potential. We know why is a function of K and L. We have L. We have L and some L. Some women are educated high properly. So then is the SDG goal, SDG target. So from that point of view, also this this topic and this area of gender equity is very important. <music>